Welcome. My name is Jennifer Wistrand, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Kennan Institute. Thank you for joining us today to discuss Missing Page, American Modern and Postmodern Dance in Russian Culture. Before I introduce our guest, I'd like to encourage you to stay up to date on the Kennan Institute's work by visiting our webpage and subscribing to our events and publications. Today's guest is Dr. Yelena Yushkova. She is currently a visiting Fulbright Scholar at the University of Kentucky, and she was previously a scholar in residence at the Kennan Institute from 2007 to 2008. Professor Yushkova is the author of two Russian language monographs, including the first ever monograph to be published in Russia about Isidore Duncan. She's currently working on an English language book about Isidore Duncan and the Russian Soviet culture. After Professor Yushkova speaks, there will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question for our guest, please submit your question via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please remember to include your name and affiliation when doing so. Professor Yushkova, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'd like to share my screen at first and to, to start from the beginning. Just a second. Do you, do you see my screen? Not yet. We're not seeing not yet. it. Uh -huh. And now? Now it looks like it's coming up. OK, great. Okay. Um, today, I'm going to talk about how and when uh, the American modern and postmodern dance came to Russia and why it happened so late. For introduction, I'd like to read several quotes. The first one is from Nikita Khrushchev's speech of 1963. He had already demonstrated his attitude to non-traditional, non-figurative art at the exhibition of the Union of Artists in Moscow, Manesh, which took place in 1962. But this quote is about modern dance. He said, a feeling of obje objection is evoked by some so-called modern dances brought into our country from the West. I've already, I've had a chance to travel a lot around the country. I've seen Russian, Ukrainian, Kazakh, Uzbek, Armenian, Georgian, and other dances. These are beautiful dances, to watch them is pleasant, but the so-called modern fashionable dances are simply something obscene. The devil knows what. They say that one can see such indecent things only in the religious sect of shakers. I cannot attest to this because I've never attended their meetings. What kind of modern dance he had in mind, in mind is, is not clear, but paradoxically, one of the, um, one of the, um, um, works by Doris Humphrey, a representative of American modern dance, was uh, entitled Shakers and presented this cult and its followers. The composer Aaron Copland used one of the Shakers ritual songs for famous Martha Graham's performance, Appalachian Spring. The icon of American modern dance, Martha Graham, following the ideas of her teacher, Ted Schoen, formulated her lofty mission to make dance as an art of and from America, stressing its American origin and its potential audience. I'll return to Martha Graham late. Now I will switch to a relatively recent event in Russia. In 2010, the American choreographer Mark Morris honored professor at several universities and a subject of a well-illustrated biography written by the renowned dance critic Joanna Cacella, who unfortunately passed away last week, brought his world-famous dance group to take part in the special program of the festival Golden Mask, called Golden Mask Plus. It was his first trip to Russia, although he was already known worldwide. In Moscow, he showed his legendary performance to Brussels music, Dido and Aeneas, staged in 1989 in Belgium and kept in the repertory of his dance group for many years. Speaking of the reaction of Russian dance critics to say that they were in a state of shock is an understatement. In promo articles, which you will see right now, uh, they also promised a real catharsis to, to the audience. And after the show, one of the critics admitted that we have missed the whole page of American choreography. 
Although Morris, when answering the question of European critics about his dance philosophy, stated that, I quote, I dance, you watch, that's my philosophy, rephrasing the famous statement by Judson, Judson Church dancers, we are doing, you are watching, he, he definitely was a product of the dance development in America in the 20th century. He absorbed so many different styles that American critics counted dozens of them in his performances, both traditional and radical. Development of dance in the USA in the 20th century was stormy. It started in the 1920s, although in the very beginning of the century, three of American forerunners, Maud Allen, Isadora Duncan, and Lloyd Fuller, performed extensively, but mostly in Europe. In the USA, the history of modern dance was launched by two prominent dancers, Roots and Dennis and Ted Schoen, who performed in many American cities and raised a new generation of dancers in their Dennis Schoen schools. You can see the class of Dennis Schoen school where some of the future founders practice. Four, four leading figures in modern dance known as four pioneers, Martha Graham, Doris Humphrey, Hania Holm, and Charles Whitman started to perform in the 1920s. These four pioneers and their peers sought contemporary American subjects. Their experiments and tours helped to establish American audiences and students who, who continued to search for their own ways of expression in dance. But none of, the, uh, of these people had performed in the USSR. However, their fellow American Isadora Duncan not only had numerous tours of Russia before the revolution and significantly influenced dance development in Russia, Soviet Union, but also founded her, her own school in Moscow in 1921. In the beginning of the 1930s, dance critic John Martin introduced the new term, modern dance, in his lectures and books. Thus, modern dance was institutionalized and its representatives taught at colleges and universities. What was going on in Russia at the same time? Paradoxically, modern dance also existed in the country, even before the revolution, and its dances were influenced not only by Isidore Duncan, but also by European dance innovators, Rudolf Laban, Mary Wigman, and others. Nicoletta Misler, in her recent book, The Russian Art of Movement, analyzed different styles of pre or plastic dance developed in numerous studios existing in Russia and the Soviet Union until the end of the 1920s. Even when Isadora Duncan came to Soviet Russia in 1921, one, her style was closer to modern dance, less lyrical and harmonious it, as it was previously. A book on contemporary or modern dance depending on translation was published in Russia in 1922 by art historian Alexei Sidorov, 10 years prior to John Martin's book. Sidorov touched upon the development of dance not only in the USSR, but also in Europe, mostly in Germany, where he had lived for several years. He also mentions the American dancer Roots and Dennis and her company Dennis Schoen. But for some reason, he calls the dancer in her company not American, but English. Possibly he saw her performances in Germany. Despite numerous examples of interesting dance projects in Russia, Sidorov concludes in a sad way. We don't know contemporary dance culture. We have never seen Roots and Dennis, Gertrude Leistikov, Alexander Sakharov, whose dance went further than Isadora Duncan's. We have a gifted artists of plastic dance, but we, let's admit, are still a terrible province. His reference to Roots and Dennis also confirms his notion. Sidorov was quite optimistic about the new dance form in the USSR, or just pretended to be, concluding his book saying that on the threshold of a new life, a new dance lights up the pathway. However, one of the contemporary Russian dance historians entitled her paper, Modern Dance in Russia, Interrupted Flight. Why was it interrupted? During Stalin's Cultural Revolution, all experimental dance studios were closed. I quote, the persecution of free dance was caused by its open display of the body, its non-Soviet non -Soviet aesthetics, which were called decadent, and its complete indifference to Bolshevik ideology, end of quote. Soviet authorities shut down almost all avenues of expression not related to, to socialist realism. You can see this transition on the page of Nicoletta Misler's book, The Gallery of Images, 
ends with two photos of philosopher Spend and historian, art historian Gabrichevsky, who worked at the State Academy of Artistic Sciences, which had a DAS research department. These people were imprisoned. Isadora Duncan, who opened her school in post-revolutionary country, had revolutionary dances in her repertoire and glorified USSR abroad, was labeled as a representative of bourgeois culture, according to the Soviet Encyclopedia of the 1930s. The principles of modern dance, as formulated in the 1970s by the dance historian Don McDonough, are totally foreign to the art of social, of social realism, which was supposed to show a glossed reality, conflict of good and better, and life in its revolutionary development. That is why, since the 1930s, Soviet audiences were allowed to see on official stages only classical ballet and pseudo folk dance, which were optimistic, had strict codified language, and did not focus on the com complicated inner life of the contemporary person. As Christina Ezrahi shows in her seminal book, Swans of the Kremlin, the old classical ballet was loved not only by Stalin himself, but also but new, by, by the new proletarian audience. Isadora Duncan is generally seen as a precursor to radical dance movement that swept New York City in the 1930s, and her pilgrimage to Russia set a precedent for left-wing dances. Choreographers from the New Dance Group and the Workers' Dance League in New York staged politically charged performances, and some of them in Isadora's footsteps came to the USSR. Ed Naoko, Edith Siegel, Mignon Garland, Lillian Shapiro released many elements of the Soviet new life, but did not like Soviet dance. Siegel, who visited the Soviet Union in 1931, said that dance she saw there was awful, they hadn't learned anything. They had no background of modern dance. The student of Martha Graham and leader of her, her own company, Anna Sokolov, spent three months in Russia in 1934, but she felt Russian audiences didn't understand her work and was unimpressed by Russian dance. She wrote, my performance had something of the effect usually attributed only to gentlemen who pull rabbits out of heads. The audience had never seen anything like it before. It was entirely outside of their experience. They sat mentally agape, unheard of dancing, no pretty curled movements, no acrobatic periods. This, uh, this comment shows that Isadora Duncan's art and the numerous plastic dance experiments had been com completely forgotten by 1934. Another modern dance representative, Pauline Connor, came to the USSR in 1934 and stayed for two years. She was invited by the Soviet Concert Bureau. Performing in Leningrad, Moscow, and Sverdlovsk, Connor was so successful that she came up with the idea to cre create her own group and school, which wasn't realized. As Julia Mickenberg reveals in her book based on the dancers' diaries, Connor was determined to create the first great Soviet dance art, she wrote, I shall have a school subsidized by the Russian government. The thing I primarily came to Russia for, to complete what Isadora Duncan began. Finally, she was invited to teach dance at the Lesgov Le Physical Culture Institute in Leningrad, where some people from former modern dance communities worked, and was asked to design one of the cultural parades for 70,000 people. It is not known if your scenario was used for staging a mass parade, but those parades became regular in the USSR. As Mickenberg stresses, I quote, physical culture in the Soviet Union emphasized the cultural dimensions of movement. Dance taught under the, ru the rubric of physical culture was to be collective, vigorous, and easily intelligible to the masses. What Connor didn't realize was that the appoint appointment put her within the Stalinist project of milita milita mi militarizing Soviet youth. End of quote. After attending lots of dance performances, Connor came to the same conclusion as Siegel and Sokolov. She saw Russian attempts at, at modern dance as banal. Two of the dance forms mentioned above and officially accepted in the USSR, classical ballet and pseudo folk dance, at the beginning of the 1930s were thriving. In 1937, Igor Moiseev created his world-famous ensemble. 
So yet Bali survived post-revolution era chaos and received immense state support. These two dance forms wonderfully conveyed Soviet identity. On the one hand, an aspiration for pure perfection, perfection in Balia, which correlated with the total glossing over the truth. And on the other hand, narodnost, a people-oriented way of perceiving reality. By the 1950s, Soviet dance had its canons, and during the Cold War, the time-tested approved representatives of the dance community were assigned to represent the country abroad. But the U.S. State Department also chose ballet for tours of the USSR, although Martha Graham's company was sent all over the world to establish through cultural diplomacy a positive image of the USA and to propagate freedom and democracy. She was supposed to come to the USSR in 1989, but it never happened. The political and ideological context and numerous subtexts of cultural exchanges between the USA and USSR are covered in Victoria Phillips' works and are beyond my talk. In the 1950s, the new dance trend evolving in the USA, the postmodern dance was also very far from socialist realism, classical ballet, and pseudo folk dance. Judson Memorial Church Dance Theater proclaimed new approach which couldn't be delivered to the USSR in the framework of cultural diplomacy, being too radical and perplexing. Thus, the art of this group of innovators didn't find its way to the Soviet Union. Nurse Cunningham, one of the leaders of, his, of this movement and former student of Martha Graham, didn't have a chance to show his experimental works to the Soviet audience, although he was sent to Europe by the State Department. However, during the Zoo, the new uh, genre came, which came to the USSR after the sixth festival of youth and students held in Moscow and after the tours of uh, the French mime Marcel Marceau was pantomime, which soon gave birth to a new form of theater, plasticity, interpretive, physical, plastic, or even dance theater, a term which is difficult to translate. It had lots in common with the modern dance. After the fall of the Soviet Union, many non-traditional non -traditional dance forms poured, poured into the country. European contemporary dance in particular gave a strong impulse to the new Russian dance, while the classical ballet be became just an old fashioned formalistic art, commercial product for expert. You can see some of the founders of uh, uh, the new genre here. Since that time, dance development, developing, developing quickly had reflected the formation of a new Russian person, free thinking, creative, open to the world, and also expressed the dramatic change in mentality. Contemporary dance um, developing in small amateur groups uh, became quite noticeable, and even a professional magazine, uh, magazine Ballet, wrote about it in almost every issue in the 1990s. Festivals of contemporary dance took place in many Russian cities and neighboring countries. The most popular was held in Vitebsk, Belarus. Young people went to study abroad, invited European choreographers. From 1982 until the end of the 1990s, Russian dancers took part in exchange programs with the American Dance Festival and invited American choreographers for master classes on different techniques, including contra contraction and release by Martha Graham. In 1989, Trisha Brown's group came to Russia, but her tour was not successful. You see that this quote reminds the impressions of Anna Sokolov mentioned above. Trisha Brown said that it was the most avant-garde American modern dancing the Russians had seen, and the audiences were mystified. In 1992, the magazine Ballet, just renamed from Sovietsky Ballet, devoted the special issue to Martha Graham when she died. Russian dancer and choreographer Sasha Kukin not only studied dance in the USA, but later was invited to teach at several American universities. And uh, at the end of the 1990s, critics admitted the high professional level of contemporary dance and its integration into the Russian cultural landscape. By 2020, choreographers of contemporary dance have received several prestigious Golden Mask Awards 
the main price for its theater production in Russia. Unfortunately, in uh, 2023, the nomination contemporary dance was excluded from the competition by the Russian Ministry of Culture. In the 1980s, the autobiography by the mother of, of the modern dancers, Adora Duncan, was finally translated into Russian and reprinted numerous times. Unfortunately, for many years, perception of her art and legacy was defined by her marriage to the poet Sergei Yesenin, so loved by the Russian audiences. And almost every year, a new version of their love story was retold, mostly by female writers. Despite her tremendous pop popularity, popularity and influence on Russian modern dance, the first monograph on Isadora's art and legacy was released in Russian language only in 2019 and was supported by the Kennan Institute, an undesirable organization in Russia now. American modern and postmodern dance was introduced to the Russian audiences only in the 21st century, when the world-famous ballet historian Elizaveta Suric published a book on ballet and dance in America. But she devoted only one relatively short chapter to, to non-classical dance. The iconic book by Nancy Reynolds, No Fixed Points, uh, no Fixed Points on History of, of Dance, published in 2003, gave a title to a new Russian dance media, which was supposed to write not only on new trends in choreography, but also to introduce historical dance styles of the 20th century. As you can see, the cover of the media has a portrait of Nurse Cunningham, who never visited the USSR. Mark Morris mentioned above came to Russia in 2010. Five years later, the Martha Graham dance group performed in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And then the real boom started. In, 2000, in 2017, the Museum of Contemporary Art Garage in Moscow launched a new book series, series on dance, starting with Graham's famous memoir, Blood Memory. Then Garage released the books by Sally Baines, Doris Humphrey, and finally, Norse Cunningham. The release of the last book coincided with the showing of the beautifully made 3D film on Cunningham by Alla Kovgan in Russian movie theaters. Lectures and programs on dance gained tremendous popularity and were held in numerous cultural institutions in Moscow, which were so well funded during the Sabianian's cultural renaissance. Two of the most respectable art, uh, art institutions uh, initiated free educational um, uh, programs on dance history. One of them, Garage, was mentioned above, and the other project, Arzamas, online educational interactive project, present, presenting to the Russian audience uh, the course on the history of contemporary da dance, which has roots in modern and postmodern dance, included the reconstructions of the technique by Martha Graham and Nurse Cunningham, which you will see right now. They had a rubric, uh, a rubric called Nine Languages of Contemporary Dance, and the uh, Russian dancers, Sofia Gidukova and Konstantin Matulevsky, show the basics of two American choreographers' technique.
the second picture. Garage Publishing House um, uh, had lots of ideas about further publications and festival managers planned to invite American dance groups. Unfortunately, Russian-American cultural cooperation came to an end in the beginning of 2022. However, Moscow, St. Petersburg and some other big cities still host significant dance festivals of contemporary dance, although the programs now are quite limited and they also provide lectures on dance history. There are numerous video archives on the internet. There are dance teachers who, ha who have been trained in different dance styles, including non-classical American dance. There are professionals that professional dance, dance, com dance companies practicing contemporary, which includes different choreographic styles, historical and experimental. The art of American pioneers will be transmitted to new generations of Russian dancers. At least there is hope that it will happen. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Yelena, that was wonderful. Such a comprehensive history. I'm sure, I mean, I, I had no idea about that, that type of history going back to the early 20th century that you shared. So thank you so much. Uh, before, I wanna encourage our audience members um, to start sending in your questions um, that you have for Professor Yushkova. So as a reminder, uh, please, um, please develop your questions and please submit them via the Q&A function at the base of your Zoom screen. And as soon as questions start coming in, I will begin sending them to Professor Yushkova. But while people are developing their questions, maybe I will ask you a couple of questions, Yelena. Um, Going back through, again, the timeline, the chronology that you gave, I was wondering, could you spend a little bit more talking about, it seems like kind of that critical period, you know, you had this increase of interest in the 90s and then kind of the beginning of the 21st century, obviously, you know, did you, could you talk a little bit more, I guess, maybe about the early part of the 21st century and then also maybe building on this, what, what do you think is going to happen? Like, I, I don't want to ask you to prognosticate, but let's say 10 years out, do you think we've lost that opportunity for you know, modern contemporary dance to have a place in, in Russia because of what's going on? Uh, you know, uh, the um, cultural life of the beginning of the 21st century in Russia was so rich. And maybe that's why the American modern dance war was not a priority, but still there was so much of everything. The whole world came to Russia. There were so many festivals and so many dance groups from Europe, especially. And uh, my, most of the people were more interested in ex actually European dance because yeah, uh, there were so, so famous dance groups. and they came to many festivals and actually the um, new uh, dance venues uh, were open and uh, some some of them were, some people just used their enthusiasm first to create the new companies uh, but uh, especially uh, for instance uh, there was a, a, a group in St. Petersburg called uh, Canon Dance which uh, had uh, its festival open look and uh, last year, it it became uh, it 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 got uh, substantial state support 
for instance. And now uh, there is a st state uh, dance theater dance group and uh, funded by the state dance festival, which uh, they conduct. But they focus mostly on Russian contemporary, but all, always invite invite many uh, dance groups from Europe. And I actually I saw a, a couple of times American groups in their festival so they were interested in uh, these da dance trends but and um, I I mean uh, the uh, embassy and um, American embassy and um, American consulates uh, had these programs uh, in and they brought some uh, groups from America uh, as well uh, and it, actually, uh, they even support uh, some non-traditional dance forms. Uh, for instance, uh, when I went to the dance festival in Yaroslavl, in provincial city of Russia, I saw that there was a, gr a group of dancers, uh, in, in, uh, which include, included the people with uh, disabilities. And there was um, uh, a guy on wheelchair who danced so brilliantly. He had such a, such strong hands, uh, hands, and he, he, he was just excellent. But he used used this wheelchair, and it and it it was played. Uh, I mean, his disability very well, and people uh, in, included he, him in his dan in the dances. So it was so great. So I, I mean, uh, the presence of American dance was uh, kind of immense, but maybe. It, it uh, wasn't dominant because uh, people were interested more in European dance trends, which uh, which are very interesting. Uh, yeah, but uh, and uh, the invitation of of Mark Morris was, I, I mean, a culmination and a very high point in these cultural exchanges and. Uh, in, and finally, Martha Graham, uh, Graham group came to Russia, and it was also a shock for Russian dance critics. So, and uh, there is nothing uh, written on Mark Morris in Russian except for my articles. If you if you search uh, Russian uh, Russian Google, uh, and you you will find only my articles on my Mark Morris. I, I'm an academic. I critics wrote something about him after his tour. So. And no one, no one, for instance, knows knows Anna Sokolov because when I presented um, some uh, my papers on uh, conferences, uh, people just were very surprised they haven't heard this name. But she was an influential choreographer actually in America, and her um, very famous performance called um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, she she had a she had a very iconic performance, which is staged now in, in a group in in a group in New York named after after her. So, and uh, this actually, is it, wonderful. No, as I say, this is wonderful. I think again, because this is just giving giving all of us so much more of the the. the the texture of the people who have been over in the exchanges, but as you pointed out, so little coverage, right? So little academic writing on it. Uh, we are starting to get a number of questions coming in. So I want to make sure that our audience members get their questions asked. Uh, first question comes from Blair Rubel, former director of the Kennan Institute. And he, he says, I note that you did not mention Boris Eichmann and the group of those around him. So maybe speak to that. Yeah, Barry Seifman is a very interesting uh, person. Now he is also very on, on, honored, <laughs> and but he was a kind of a revolutionary for uh, the time of uh, the 1980s, and he also practiced uh, a mix of ballet and modern dance and contemporary dance. He, he has very expressive uh, performances and. Uh, he's uh, well known abroad, but uh, but now he uh, um, he established his uh, his own tr troop uh, group uh, maybe twenty years ago, and um, it is also uh, has a, it also has state support now, and of course he he refers to many traditions uh, of the twentieth century choreography, including modern dance. 
because you know there is a, uh, there were strange ways how American modern dance uh, came to the Soviet Union. It, it was not uh, very open, but still it found its way, like many other um, forbidden stuff. So yeah, Eifman is a very interesting uh, person, but I didn't did mention him in my presentation because he he pretend pretends to create his own style, and he doesn't refer to any kind of modern style of contemporary. He has I uh, uh, he says I am very Eifman, and this is my style. <laughs> so excellent, thank you. Next question comes from. Um, Annette Seidenglass, um, very interesting question. She says, I'm surprised that Russians uh, have difficulty with non-narrative dance. Isn't there a lot of attention to gymnastics? That seems like an avenue for understanding contemporary dance. Yeah, uh, the gymnastics was created actually uh, in the, the 1920s, special gymnastics for Soviet people to create a new Soviet, Soviet body. There are lots of discussions right now about the Soviet body, actually. And it, 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 two, two young girls from the very interesting group called Isidore and Nagore, which could be translated like Isadora's Grief, and it's a role play. And they uh, uh, had a very interesting project. They uh, went to the Russian archives and studied uh, all uh, kind of um, papers from the 1920s about how people practiced this uh, kind of new Soviet gesture they called, and they, finally they published their book called Soviet Gest Gesture. And they recreated all kind of trainings uh, those people of the 1920s had. So it's, it was a very interesting uh, book and project. I mean, and the, it, the project was supported by uh, Garage, actually. But this kind of modern dance was tra transformed later into gymnastic, in the, in, into artistic gymnastics. And even uh, in the school of Isadora Duncan, they, uh, they practiced some kind of moments, which then by Isadora's followers were included into the system of artistic gymnastics, which is so popular right now. So uh, I don't know. No, if yeah, I, no, I that was a, no, th I thought that was such an interesting question by our audience member. And actually you just touched on it because uh, correct me, I'm wrong. Didn't rhythmic, rhythmic gymnastics, right? Didn't that become very, I remember that when that debuted in the Olympics and that's been very popular. Was it the, 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 the the Russian teams have been very popular. So again, going back to the audience members' questions, kind of that that connection between, you know, uh, I guess again a more mere lyrical form of gymnastics. Yeah. Um, we more questions are popping in. So our next question comes from uh, Michael Keys, um, who's with the Kennan Institute, but former U.S. General Consul in Vladivostok. Are the criticisms of American modern dance mainly from European Russia? I ask because Siberia and the Russian Far East take pride in innovation and the entrepreneurial spirit, and also in the culture of their neighbors, including Japan and South Korea, which are very different. Yeah, very good question. Excellent uh, question. And interestingly, that I mentioned the exchange programs uh, between Russia and the USA. Uh, which were held in the framework of uh, the NGO uh, works uh, of American Dance Festival. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, person who went to American Dance Festival program was actually a choreographer from Novosibirsk, from Siberia. And she studied uh, modern dance technique in, in America during the summer the seminar. And she brought it to Novosibirsk, to Siberia. And she created a group uh, at the university in Novosibirsk. She created a group of contemporary dance. It was actually one of the first uh, groups in, in Russia. And uh, then it, it, they appeared in Moscow and, and St. Petersburg. So uh, the people from Siberia, I, I totally agree, are very creative. They, um, they, they are maybe uh, are, yeah, sorry. And uh, yeah, 
And there, is, there are so many festivals now in Siberia. Uh, there is a very famous festival in Perm, um, which is uh, devoted to Diaghilev because Diaghilev was born in Perm. And there, there is a festival called Isidora, uh, how we call it, uh, Isidora Duncan. In Novosibirsk, actually, it's a festival of contemporary dance. So uh, this Siberia works very extensively and Far East as well, because I, I didn't put a, a photo of a choreographer Olga Bavdilovich from Vladivostok, but she is also one of the founders of this contemporary dance um, the movement in, in Russia and one of the classic uh, contemporary classic of this genre. So yeah, the, the Siberian Far East regions are very active in this movement. Yeah, no, this, this was another excellent question, right? Because it got us, obviously, Russia is a very large country, as we know. So it makes sense that you're going to have different priorities in different parts of the country. Uh, just a note again to our audience to please keep sending in your questions. Um, and again, you can do that by the, the Q&A function at the base of your screen. Uh, another question that has come in from Lisa Sundstrom. Uh, she writes, Yelena, this is wonderful. I learned so much. As a political scientist and former dancer, I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about the current politics. For example, do you know how and why contemporary dance was removed as a category for the Golden Mask Awards in 2023? Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, it was removed and it, it was a um, political decision, of course. Uh, I don't know the reason, the, the official reasons were uh, not uh, announced, but I guess, again, it looks not, not, not aligned with the party line, like we called it in the Soviet time. So maybe it's too free, too, too independent, and it is not under control, because these people are very uh, free thinking, very independent, very creative, and too, might, maybe too creative, which is not allowed in Russia right now. And so, yeah, it's a very sad, sad actually event and people protested. There was an open letter published in St. Petersburg Theatre Journal, but no reaction followed. So unfortunately, yeah, I, I mean, the contemporary dance, dance of course still lives and it will live, but it's going kind of underground again, and uh, people are working uh, very, very hard right now. I know the person; um, she's a dance scholar, and now she she's working on a, a huge archive about American, uh, sorry, American Russian contemporary dance. And um, there are some venues. I mean, in in Kaluga, there is a house of dance which uh, also hosts lots of uh, festival and tra training programs so and, uh, of course uh, the genre will exist but uh, not so official like it was before and yeah to, uh, the, the last year uh, it was uh, terrible in terms of cultural uh, stuff and so the contemporary dance is not extension so the policy of excluding everything of canceling everything it is developing very fast in Russia, unfortunately, right now. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Our next question comes from Laurel Victoria Gray. Excellent presentation. To what extent did the biomechanics of Mayerhold and the experimental dances of Vera Maya shape the early development of modern dance in Russia? Yeah, it's, it's, I think the, the question is a very interesting question that many people uh, study the relationships between modern dance and biomechanics, but uh, I mean, the, the technique which Merholt uh, created uh, was um, very specific. Uh, it uh, Maybe it was uh, to some point connected to modern dance, of course, but um, yeah, but I mean, it's a very, very big topic. I even don't know how to, to touch upon it. But of course, uh, yeah, it was uh, more um, 
as appropriate for the new Soviet uh, life. I mean, biomechanics was kind of very uh, rhythmical, very, uh, very, um, um, some kind of uh, mechanical, which was um, so fashionable in the, the Soviet Union, uh, in the early Soviet Union, and even. Uh, a guy, uh, one uh, dancer, choreographer created this uh, dances of uh, machines. So uh, it was a kind of development of uh, biomechanics uh, to some extent. And of course, they uh, all these uh, movements in dance and uh, stage uh, stage movement, uh, theater. Uh, uh, movement were interrelated, and uh, uh, of course, uh, Merhold uh, uh, used so many uh, inventions uh, made by uh, people in Europe, especially because most of uh, Russian and early Soviet um, uh, cultural uh, actors went to mostly to, to Europe uh, for exchanges, and yeah, and the system was very influential, uh, unfortunately. Uh, in the 1930s, you know what happened to Mirhold. So, and now it, it is being researched very actively. Lots of uh, volumes on Mirhold and his biomechanics, so and the different aspects of its relationships with Russian and Soviet culture. So, I hope it, it will continue. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, our next question. From, from Michael Keyes from Kennan Institute. Um, why was Isadora Duncan accepted by the USSR? She certainly pushed the limits by Western standards. Was it because she was willing to advocate the strengths of the USSR abroad? She became a Soviet citizen. Uh, when she died at age 50, was she still acceptable to the USSR? Uh, Isadora Duncan went actually to the Soviet Russia because uh, she got an invitation in London from the uh, um, from Leonid Krasin, who was a Russian a Soviet Union representative, uh, or Soviet Russia re representative in London, because she she wasn't able to find uh, funding for her, her new school in Europe, because after the uh, World War One, uh, just uh, there was no way to find any support from European governments. She tried hard and um, she she had already uh, had uh, several schools. Uh, one of them was uh, in Germany, the second was in uh, France, and uh, she, she even had a school for, for a very uh, limited time in the USA. But when she got this in invitation, she was so excited because they she was um, they promised to her that uh, they would give her 1000 children to teach and this was her, her dream to teach as many people as she could and that's why she came to russia but uh, and uh, actually she was a very revolutionary person herself and she believed that uh, maybe maybe she was too idealistic but she believed that one day uh, the new world will uh, would be uh, built in, in the Soviet Union, and uh, that's why she came to the Soviet to the Soviet uh, Russia and founded this school. But it it wasn't wasn't an um, easy project to uh, realize, and it, it wasn't finally it wasn't very successful. But when she went, uh, she she went uh, to the US. USS, the USA in uh, in the in the beginning of the 1920s, and yeah, she did propagate uh, the Soviet Union. She uh, she proclaimed that she was red. She wore a red tunic, and she said that uh, the new life and real life is possible only in the USSR. And for her so-called red propaganda, she was excluded. Uh, she she uh, was deprived of her American citizenship. Yeah, but then she had to to leave the USSR also because uh, the, the government couldn't support her school anymore. That's why she she ended up in Europe where she was desperate to find uh, any support for her Moscow school. So 
I'm sorry. <laughs> no, this is fascinating. Thank you so much, Helena. These are excellent questions. Our, our next one comes from uh, Marjorie Mandelson Balzer of Georgetown University. What is your own background and entry into this fascinating topic? Were you a modern dancer in Russia? Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not a dancer myself, um, but I I studied the so-called plastic theater, which I showed uh, you recently. And I, I was part of this uh, theater. I worked uh, there for a while I, I, as a volunteer, and I made some programs for performances. So I went to the rehearsals, and I was so impressed. But because in the Soviet time, this kind of art was just too amazing. So it was no so non-Soviet, and it was so inspiring, inspiring, and I, I admired it so much. And then. It just came out of fashion in the 1990s, unfortunately. And the founder of this uh, kind of theater, Gedrus Matskaychus, who, who was from Lithuania originally, and who lived in Moscow, he, he died in, in the 2000s. So it was my, my back, background. And since uh, I was interested in the history of this genre in the USSR, I uh, went to the libraries and I studied this uh, criticism of the beginning of the 20th century and I found out that uh, everything was uh, born after Isadora Duncan's uh, first tours of Russia. So the genre appeared actually at this time after Isadora Duncan's tours. And then I got this uh, fellowship at the Kennan Institute, which allowed me to gather materials on Isadora Duncan and finally to write my, my book about her. So, uh, and now uh, just, uh, I am interested in the more broader co context of Isadora Duncan. So it's a modern dance, of course, and uh, to some extent, postmodern dance as well. So I hope my project will be of interest, interest in, in Russia one day as well. Well, thank you, Yelena. Uh, next question comes from Karen Patron. What do you make of the Soviet echoes of the rejection of modern dance? You began with Khrushchev's disdain for the genre. Is the current situation a return to proto-Soviet attitudes among government leaders? And can you draw out the implications of that? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it seems like that, that uh, the situation uh, turns to be similar to the Soviet times, but I hope that maybe the bad things won't happen and uh, the government just won't be able to control everything because, you know, there are so many horizontal uh, connections between people right now who practice dance. And I am not sure if uh, the government could control all the festivals, all the private groups who studied dance. So I hope it, it won't happen. And uh, so in the Soviet time, there was no the internet, but now it exists and people can even can find some uh, articles uh, online and read foreign languages, which was, was common in the Soviet times as well. So I hope the situation won't be the same, but... Uh, Although it's quite bad for, uh, right now, but uh, hope it won't happen. <laughs> no, excellent. Thank you, Yelena. It's a tough question to answer. Um, our next question comes from Leslie Friedman. In 1985, I was the first dancer presented with joint US USSR support, performed in Moscow and Leningrad, lectured and danced at GITIS great response and encouragement for development of new dance. Now political control and lack of funds to start independent artists and groups. 1985, Gorbachev was announced as leader, much optimism. Ballerina spoke at my Moscow performance. What came, what can help the artists? Yeah, so basically I guess what you kind of building on the previous question. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, the state state funding, of course, helps uh, independent artists. And even Martha Graham uh, 
could survive and her group was able to survive because she got the, this opportunity to be included in this cultural diplomacy project because it wasn't possible to survive in, in America at uh, that time. But now uh, uh, these festivals, uh, the big festivals um, in Russia, uh, used to be supported by the state, but maybe, I, I don't know how, how it's possible to now to survive, but the festivals, there is a kind of inertia uh, and maybe some budgets uh, are allocate, allocated for uh, for festivals, but, and there are actually, there are private festivals like Diana Vishnova's uh, context, uh, context uh, because she she created her own foundation and she finances uh, these projects herself. Maybe she she uses uh, some funds from rich Russian people. And actually, Garage uh, is a private project. It is funded by Roman Abramovich and his former wife uh, Daria Zhukova and. Uh, so it's kind of independent uh, to some extent, but. Yeah, but uh, I, I mean, no, not really independent, but and yeah, but no, this is excellent. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. And we're getting only got a few minutes left, and um, maybe take a, a last question by Michael Keys and kind of what, what you started to talk about a little bit, you know, cultural diplomacy. But Michael Keys asks, um we haven't mentioned Mikhail Bershnikov, who was trained in classical dance, but has been a promoter of modern dance. He is now 75. When we eventually re-engage Russia, can you foresee a possible role for him in cultural exchange? Yeah, maybe some answer that question, then just more broadly kind of in summing up, you know, what do you think? Um, a lot of people are kind of trying to get you to say, what do you think is the future of, you know, kind of cultural diplomacy, cultural exchange? You know, what, what do you think would be the most effective way ultimately to re-engage Russian audience? I guess that uh, cultural diplomacy is very needed. And yeah, Baryshnikov is doing a great job. He uh, tried himself himself in many different uh, genres and he the styles. He, he he performed with Marcia Graham, uh, actually, company. And he uh, went back to, back to Riga recently. He presented, he took part in a drama uh, play stage for him himself uh, actually but uh, and he he has uh, his own foundation which supports actually projects related to Isadora Duncan and uh, recently Lori Belilov, Belilov who is a very famous um, choreographer and dancer and who support who um, uh, who is trained in Isadora Duncan's uh, style she she got a fellowship from Baryshnikov and she spent some uh, months in residence in New York uh, in his uh, foundation so uh, but you need uh, you, you know uh, the um, these exchanges of, of course need some state support uh, and I wish <laughs> It, it could happen again. Oh, thank, thank you, Yelena. Um, and I just want to add, I, mean, I think everyone who's asked you a question has just thanked you so much for your presentation um, and said how wonderful it was and encouraging you to keep up your, your research and your publication and your public speaking on this topic. So unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time. Um, I want to thank again our guest, Dr. Yelena Yushkova, and I also want to thank our audience members for their excellent questions they sent in. And we look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Thank you very much.